and I will set the screen sharing. It's like, um, num, uh, which one is it? I think it's this one. Um, uh, I think that's the right screen. Uh, okay, so let's prepare a few other things the chat window and so on. Okay, so um, during the last lecture, we started taking a look into how. Uh, on a low level, the computer is uh, interacting and representing variables, and we have learned about built-in types that they are um, that the availability of built-in types is mostly um, or rather entirely uh, defined by what uh, registers are available in a CPU. So any built-in type must fit into one of the CPU registers; otherwise, the CPU cannot do anything with it except just copying memory in bulk. Um, and we uh, had taken a look on integer numbers and floating point numbers. Do I, did we do floating point numbers? Yes. No, we did not. Um, then, no, no, well, we did here. Okay, th that's good enough. I think this is enough what we need to say about floating point numbers uh, to start with. Um, the exact uh, specification how those numbers are represented uh, internally. Um, that information can be find in the found in the specification. So I think this is the right one. Uh, and here, if you go on this site, I can s uh, send the link into the chat as well. What it what it shows you is um, at the top the binary representation of the in I so all the individual bits. Then it shows you the different uh, components that you can uh, play with. And I think this should give you somewhat, if you want to play with that, an understanding how such floating point numbers work internally. Normally, there is not really an, a need to uh, to to mess with them on this level, but it's a fun a fun exercise. So um, there will be homework uh, for the next lecture, in which uh, the task will be to take a floating point number. So let's quickly write it down somewhere here. Um homework one uh um Um, so given a floating point numbers, uh, an arbitrary float, you need to extract uh, the sign, so it's basically a 1 or a 0, which specifies whether it's positive or negative. So if it's checked, so if it's set to 1, then it means it's negative, if it's not checked, it means it's a positive number, the exponent, which are those 8 bytes, and then whatever is rest of a 32-bit um, large register is used as the mantissa for the number. Uh, and how to do that, um, we will take a, a look on um, shortly. There is a. Uh, we will take a look on how operators work. So how you can, which operations you can perform with integer numbers, and you can use such operators to um, achieve this goal quite easily. Uh, there, there is also a more sophisticated uh, trick how which one can use to do this dissection. But uh, I won't say anything about that. Well, let's see if any one of you uh, finds this out on their own. Um, and there will be a optional part of the homework. Um, the same, but for a double. Uh, floating point number of type. type float with him, but for a double. Okay more precise floating point number of type double. So the example that you can find online, this one, is only for 32-bit uh, floating point numbers. And a double is a 64-bit number, so um, this will be um, necessary to uh, find out for oneself how to do that. I'm sure there are there are, is plenty documentation um, and maybe some examples that one can find, but uh, 
I won't point you to any. S finding solutions is also a important skill. So uh, and maybe before we take a look on operators. Now let's first start do operators and then we will do casting. So um, as you might intuitively have already noticed, we, are, we already have been using an operator, the assignment operator, to just assign a value. Um, so let's quickly for completeness write it down. Value assignment. We just use the the assign operator. That's as simple as it gets. And if you have a variable in, uh, in my var, uh, let's go. Did we use my var? We did, but only with a suffix. So let's just stick to my var. Then you can have, for example, my var is equals, and then we need to pick one of the variables we had before. For example, my const. And if we put a breakpoint here and run the application, we can see how this is uh, implemented. Well, in this case, in a boring way, because it kind of just took the const value from the top, because it knew that it cannot change. So we uh, should probably start with first having a non-const value. So let's add somewhere here a integer. Like, uh, um, then we'll uh, ca call the other variable my variable too, and we'll do this assignment. And when we run it now, we will see that now it is a more complex operation instead of one move, which just moves a 32-bit number into um, into memory at the position. Of um, at a given position, what happens here is that we have fir first an operation which loads the number, and that to the to a register in this case EAX, and then stores this register into another memory location. The way this uh, move operations work is that um, you can specify of, uh, as a operand a register or a mem a offset, and uh, when you are specifying offsets, you need you need to load the the value from somewhere, so you need to have the offset in stored in some register. But what you also can do is you can specify a register and add or subtract in one go a value from from this. So this is actually quite a complex operation because first it takes the well, it it starts with having the value in the register, then it adds to it in this the case 64 hex, um, then it gets some intermediate value which is not exposed anywhere. Um, to the user, it just exists internally in the CPU. Then it at this and the at so this number represents an address in memory. So then it loads a memory block of in this case four byte size of this size into the register. So it's is quite a complex operation. And then when we do the next step, it kind of is similar. So first, of course, it, it already has the value which it wants to store, but then f before it can store it, it needs to calculate the actual memory address. Um, for for the point and then on after that it can s be stored um, on a ARM platform which we don't have here. Uh, this would be usually just breaking up into multiple instructions. Hence, um, while the instructions are quite quite simple and can be executed very fast, you need a lot of them to achieve the same results. So, generally uh, speaking, um, if you have a ARM architecture. Uh, the performance of your system will uh, strongly depend on the amount of memory bandwidth that is available. While on a x86 x architecture, uh, memory bandwidth is not that critical. And what, however, is critical is to um, ensure that these complex operations will not be interrupted. So, the way this works, for example, in in CPUs, is there there is a pipeline in which the instructions are processed in multiple steps, and um, sometimes the system don't doesn't know which branch the code will take, so we will take on this a look uh, in a second. But what it does is it predicts where it probably will go, so that it can already start processing the instructions. But then it might find out that that was a bad prediction, and then it will need to uh, discard some parts of the operation and then redo it at the right branch. And uh, with ARM, you don't have such issues because you can usually execute all the instructions in one go, but on the downside is you need to load a lot of the instructions since you cannot have multiple instructions um, compacted into one single, in this case, three byte opcode. Okay, so this much to assignment, 
and a small tangent to <laughs> um, the implementation. The next obvious operations that we can perform is just um, normal mathematical operations, the very basic ones. Microfighters plus uh, minus multiplication division, and in C you have a modular division. So that's trivial. Was addition, subtraction, um, multiplication, and division. The modular um, operation is the remainder after the division. So if you have an integer number and you want to divide it by something and it is not uh, dividable without a rest. Uh, so in in the case you you, you, do you use the normal division, it will just give you the the, rem the in integer that you can get and the whatever the reminder would be is completely discarded. If you do the modular operation, you only get the reminder. So this is quite useful um, in certain scenarios when you, for example, want to count uh, offsets in a loop and then want to wrap around to the beginning of the loop using the modular operation. Uh, is uh, quite convenient, so we will use this in a, at a later point um, in time. Let's also have an example here. So let's uh, define int uh, var one. Actually, we can move this var in here. So let's again start with var one and var two. Uh, var one, var two, and we'll, which will be far. Five, six, and we need a bar three to get the result. We can now just, as like in a normal mathematical equation, just write one variable name plus the other variable name, and another variable receives the value that results from the operation. The way this internally is implemented um, is a bit different. We can take a look in this. Um, as you see here, the way this works is we first load the value of the first variable into a register. Then we load uh, the second variable into another register. Then we perform the addition. And then uh, we move it unnecessarily back to, to another register. If this would be a release build, this step would be omitted. And then in the last step, we write the result back to the in initial register. But you can notice here that the add operation only takes two, two operands. So even at the highest level of optimization you could not um, um, how to say it, I, it uh, in, in normal uh, x86 um, instructions your opera operations usually just take two operands. So you always modify one of, of the operands. So if you start with a value in one operand and then want to have a new value like our variable 3 um, you basically need to first have one operation where you copy it and then have a second operation where you do the addition. On ARM uh, 64 it, this is slightly different, there you have quite a few uh, trinary operations, so you have you can specify uh, two input registers and an output register so that you can um, do operations without modifying your input registers. F for practical use this is not so much of a limitation, you just uh, because the compiler automatically translates your code to whatever is the best representation binary-wise. But it's nice to know, I think that um, the x86 architecture is a accumulator-based architecture, so you always have one register in every operation which accumulates the result, and that uh, on ARM it, uh, on ARM this is uh, slightly different. Um, and on ARM also it's important to say is you have uh, much more registers available. So um, it is much easier to to be <laughs> wasteful with registers. On x86, you, you always try to use as little registers as possible, especially given that in the 32-bit version of x86, you only had eight general-purpose registers. Um, on uh, six on the 64-bit version, you have 16, so this already a bit better. But on ARM, you have, if I remember correctly, 32 registers, which is really quite a lot. There are also other ar architectures where you actually can have even, um, I think, 128 registers on MIPS, but that's a rather old platform. Um, I see there is a question in the chat. Uh, the question is um, h uh, about the homework, how it should be submitted, so uh, you should uh, upload your project to Moodle, and um, you have usually uh, two, week two weeks time to do your project, so the idea is that 
um, the tasks as scheduled in one lecture. During the next lecture, you have the opportunity to ask questions about the solution if you are if you have some issues. And only in the f uh, second lecture, after the lecture where the task was scheduled, the task has to be uploaded to the Moodle. Um, yeah, that's that. Uh, coming back to our code, so we have uh, taken a look already on this operation. So of course, with any of the other operations, this the code would look identically. Just here, the add would be replaced by another operation. And of course, if we would be using um, floating point numbers, then while the general gist of, gist of the instructions would be the same, there technically would be slightly different instructions because they would need to operate on different registers. So we can quickly demonstrate this. So as you see, um, its structure is slightly different, but we also here start by loading uh, values. Mm, and then here we have, uh, let's see, so we load one value, we load the other value. Um, not sure why we are loading this here again. Then we do the add operation and we then store the result to the to the registry. So, uh, sorry, to the from the register to the memory. So it's um, structured a bit differently, but generally it behaves similarly. And also here you only have uh, two operand operations, so <coughs> you always need one uh, accumulator register, which will be mo uh, altered while the operation is being performed. But for now, let's uh, actually we can just leave it here as an example. And as I said, f with all the other operations, it just changes um, in the code one operation. The whole rest about moving the instructions around would be the same. We can also take a look on a more complex um, equation how this would be implemented, but only for int. So this would be uh, we'll think of a number for that. Um, four or five. Oops, three four. I don't know, 7, 8, 9, and uh, um, uh, we shouldn't write numbers that start with 0, that's always bad. Uh, let's give it, I don't know, or just 0. Yeah, let, let's go with 0. So, var 1 plus var 2, uh, asterisk var 3, and we should not divide by 0, so we probably should pick here something, let's go just divide by 1. And if this is not a release build, the compiler should not optimize this operation away. Um, the compiler generally understands the order of operations, so it will not just go from left to right, but it will really know, okay, first I need to multiply and divide, and then I have to do the addition. So um, you don't need to, uh, just to be on the safe side, put everything in brackets all the time, but the compiler will do this uh, for you. Um, and I would generally assume that any decent programming language should, uh, with regard at least to the numerical operation, uh, to, uh, operations, do this correctly. We will later see that there are quite a few more operators that can be used, and which order they have is something that is then more uh, subject to the language specification. <coughs> okay, so we have first the code that prepares the variables, and then we load, uh, we could enable here maybe some names, right? Um, that doesn't help much. Okay, and that didn't help enabling names, but the idea is generally that the first one will just load um, probably variable number 2 into the register EAX. We can actually check out uh, what it is exactly. We have here this imminent window, which allows us to write very basic code, so like s s machine type variable assignments or just some simple equations. So what we can do is um, we can take here our uh, register plus value, and then we just cast this on. Uh, right, and we should turn off hex so that we see what the really is. Right, four, five, six. So, yep, this is variable two. So it is loaded into the first register. Then i mul will be integer multiplication. So it already has one value in the register. Then it just tells. Well, then, then it just <laughs> doesn't tell. The compiler tells the CPU to um, then multiply it with the next value. So the next value is just an, at an offset uh, four higher. So this will be the next one. This will be variable three, as we expect. Uh, then it will clear, uh, I think, a CD. Actually, I don't know what this operation does. It probably clears some, some status which have might been set by the uh, multiplication. 
so that it doesn't interfere with the next operation, then it do does an integer division, again each time modifying EAX, and finally uh, here we w want to do the addition, so there it loads our um, var1 into the uh, ECX register, and then it does the addition. For whatever reason it does not uh, use a version of the operation where it could load it directly, so that's um, well, th there are many. W you can do the same thing in many ways using x86 instructions. So, uh, since it's such a complex uh, instruction set, it is not like there is always one right way to do it. But usually there are a few right ways, and which one the compiler picks is up to the people that made the compiler. And since it's closed source, so we don't have an insight into why they did it this way. And finally we have again the move, which we have already noticed earlier, which kind of is not necessary, because the last operation could just here have the ECX register and then it would work as well. So the registers are, uh, especially on the 64-bit platform, uh, completely interchangeable. They can, with very little, um, very few exceptions, every register can be used for every purpose. Um, so uh, this code is uh, optimizable, let's say, it could be optimized a lot but um, it's not our task to optimize it. We can just let the compiler do it if we build a release build. So uh, let's see what other operators we can have. So uh, obviously we already um, take took taking a look on the mathematical ones. Um, then the next best thing will be uh, logical operators. And they are called uh, bitwise operators because they operate on a bit level within a variable. We'll in a second see other logical operators which um, operate slightly differently. They operate at the level of entire variables. So w uh, first let's see what we can do. We can of course have a bitwise end. Then we can have uh, or exclusive or complement ref shift and right shift. Um, so the or is a vertical pipe character. The, act the oops. this sign which you get if you press the right key on the German keyboard twice. I'm not sure why it's on the English keyboard. It's it's like used. It's a sign that you sometimes use for exponent, but in C the sign is used for an exclusive or. Uh, and then we have um, bitwise complement. So the inverse. Then we have a left shift and, and uh, bitwise. Well, it's always bitwise. Shift left and shift um, right. So shift left is two characters of this sort. So two um, less than characters and two bigger than characters are the right shift. Mm. So what does this mean? Um, is everyone familiar with? Um, the basics of, of logic, or sh shall we quickly uh, tell what these operators do? Well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, so I th I think it's fine. Uh, does everyone also know what a bit shift is? That's maybe something that's not in school. Uh, let's quickly say it. Uh, so the idea of a bit shift is that um, actually we can demonstrate this later. Uh, the idea simply is that if you have a bit pattern, you can shift it by a certain amount of places to the left or to the right, and filling up the new spaces either with zeros or with ones, depending on from which side you are shifting the data in. So um, let's uh, quickly take a look with this. I think yeah, that's, that maybe is a good idea to uh, go more in detail, so... Uh, let's go with something really sh small, a char, because it only has 8-bit. Test 1 is equals 0 b one two three four one zero zero zero. so that will be 1. Uh, we need of course to terminate our lines with the semicolon, and the other ones, let's fill them with 0, 1, 0, 1, and here with uh, 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay, so charm test 4 is equals test 1 or test 2. So 
the result of this oper uh, space is much. The result of this operation will be all the bits which are set in the first one, together with all the bits which are set in the second one. That's a very good point. Two and three. Um, right. And now let's just try the other one. So if we have the end, uh, two and let's go end with two and three because the other ones will be boring. Two and three. There we get. So this one wasn't set, and the only bit which is set in both is this bit. Um, then we can use a XOR with two and three again. And the exclusive or is a bit um, well exclusive, so it only sets. So if you have like one and one, that's zero. If you have zero and zero, that's zero. Only if you have zero and one, that's one. So it it must be either here or there. It cannot be in both, and it must not be neither because then it would of course also not work. So here we also need two, uh, five, and six. Um, char seven is like five and test. Uh, char test seven. This is then just the inverse. So if we have this number, then it will be zero b one 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 zero one zero. I think I did not drop any zeros. And now we can finally go come to the bit shift operators. Um, char test eight is equals test two and bit shift and then we specify how far we want to shift it. Let's say we want to shift it by two, two uh, byte. A bit, sorry, by two bit. And then if we take this pattern here and shift it. So we, we first push the pattern, then we shift it so we add two zeros from the front and then we cut off whatever is too much. We could also go with the other order of operations, it would be the same. Uh, and so basically you can move your bit patterns in both directions. So char test 9 is equals test 2 uh, right shi uh, left shift um, 2 and oops, this space is too much and this then uh, we what did we have we had uh, 0 1 0 we want that was the original pattern so we want to remove 2 and add 2 zeros and the way this works is that if you are using um, so if you are doing the left shift, then it always works the same way. You just shift things left and, and fill up with zeros. But there is a special case uh, if you are doing the right shift. Um, let's add here another test uh, value. Let's go with 10. If you have something that just uh, starts with a uh, with a 1, so let's again just take this value and but start it with a 1. and if the vari variable type is not unsigned, if you now would uh, to shift in this direction, test 11, test 10 by 2, so we start with the pattern, we remove 2, here we would not add zeros but add 1s, so this when you have an unsigned number and are shifting, sorry, if you have a signed number and are shifting to the right, the, by, by the bit value which is shifted in is uh, the same value the highest other bit in your number has. The, the reason for this is that you don't want the number to change sign from from plus to minus or minus to plus by changing the highest other bit. And if you have unsigned numbers, then of course they are only positive. So then when you shift in numbers from the uh, shift in zeros uh, from the left, then you always uh, would take zeros and not uh, take take one take ones in any case even if the first even even if dice or the number would be a one good so this much to this bit shift operations um, we can test this so um, let's start char test s is like zero x ff so this is pretty much just minus one all bits are set and now if we uh, test uh, test minus one is equals oops this direction um, one we just shift it by one then the resulting uh, the result of the operation should s should still effectively be minus one let's um, test this 
just real, it's something that we can put a breakpoint at, although we probably could also have a breakpoint on the closing brackets. Uh, what is it complaining about? Um, test 10. One uniform. Um, it should not truncate it. Um, I think it doesn't like it because it will interpret this as a still as a positive number. So we should just ignore the warning here. Uh, treat warning as errors. We just turn this off again. Then it will compile. Um, almost. Uh, redefinition. Did I? Yeah, I reused that. Um, now it should be fine. Okay, and if we check on this number, we see that even though we shifted it, it still is minus one because the representation of this is just all ones. And if we just shift in a one, then it will not change anything and we are just dropping a one. And if we kind of repeat the same thing, uh, however, with, um, let's call this one S2 and S3 but with a value which is not um, minus 1, but 1, 2, 7. That's the highest value that you can have uh, as a signed value. 7f... Uh, uh, right, should work. So let's um, the breakpoint and run this code. Then the number will be um, changed and Right now we need something. So the thing is, um, you can sometimes, uh, sometimes not put breakpoints on a closing bracket. It depends whether there is some code which will be automatically generated. But if you don't have automatically generated code there, it is needed if you want to have the breakpoint to just put something that you can put the breakpoint at. Uh, oh wait, it was a mistake. We should have here, of course, uh, our new value. So when we run this, we see that now we got um, 63 and 1 to 7 by the way if you divide by 2 as an integer you get 63 so here you can notice that uh, bit shifting something to the right by 1 is equals to a division by 2 if we would bit shift it by 4 uh, by 2 it would be a division by 4 and so on and since uh, on most uh, platforms um, and multiplication or division takes much more time than a bit shift on a modern CPU that is kind of not really the case because they are so optimized that they can do uh, usually even those operations in one go but this just means that there is a lot of uh, silicon involved in the operation so it will uh, consume much more energy but if you have like a very primitive uh, system like Arduino which only has a few instructions there you can expect a multiplication and division to take uh, many 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 uh, cycles and if you want to optimize your code by hand, one of the good tricks is if you know that you only divide and multiply by 2, or powers of 2, then to use bit shifts instead. Uh, but to uh, finish our demonstration, we will now oops, copy this line, just this time we will make this an unsigned integer, so this will be then um, 3, 4 and 5, and this should be 4. Uh, S4, and of course we need something to catch again the breakpoint at, and copy. Suck. And if we run this, we will see that here, the number again stays. Well, since it's uh, always negative, it it stays uh, 255. Actually, I should improve the comment 255 minus one, or well, it's. Same as it's not quite is equals, but it's the same as functionally. And you see that here the number, since it was unsigned, once once we shifted it, got reduced to one to seven because uh, a zero was was shifted in from the from the left side instead of the one. So we can also see here that um, wherever it goes by, let's see, it does the operation here. It loads this. It uses this shift, a, well, shift a right, um, and if we use the other one, shift, um, in one of them it should um, indicate that it. Uh, okay, here it kind of um, 
always uses the same instruction because it first shifts the value into the register using a different instruction so this kind of is a bit uh, tricky but if you would do this thing with uh, numbers as big as um, what the compiler can handle um, then it should uh, use different instructions for the shift as such we could quite quickly try this now that yeah we can mm, let's um, copy this into another code block um, on another note you can reuse variable names as long as they are in different uh, brackets so if they are not in the same bracket then you can reuse a variable and of course in this case the variable stops existing after the bracket closes so here we can no longer refer to test uh, 1 is equal to 0 it will just complain that this variable does not exist um, if we would have another bracket inside a bracket then we can in principle access all the variables that uh, exist in the parent bracket so here we can still access this one um, but in principle when we would have uh, a bracket inside another bracket we could redefine an existing variable and that would work then it then wherever in this bracket you are referring to the name you would refer to the new definition uh, but this is of course something that people should not do because um, you want your code to be easily readable and reusing variable names is everything but readable but anyhow com coming back to this let's go with in 64 instead of char and here we need to use of course 64 bit numbers and of course this one is not valid the minus one technically is still true this one will not be uh, right and we want something to break on Suck. right and here we see that if we ha have a signed number it uses this SAR SAR operation Wh while if we have a unsigned number it uses this SHR uh, so it's a different opcode and the opcode the different opcode tells the CPU that it should now always shift in zeros and not um, see uh, what the higher order bit is before um, yeah good so this much to this we can leave this example here I think this is still uh, good to have um, good. so let's continue with uh, the next group of operations um, comparison operations so uh, um, the, f the first double equals is just equal to so this operator takes two variables it compares them if they are the same then the result of the operation is true if they are not the same the result of the op operation is false the other one is kind of redundant it's just the opposite so if it's not equal in C++ it's an exclamation mark and then an equal mark in some other languages this is different I think in MATLAB script it's like a tilde equals but in most uh, C-like languages it's exclamation mark equals for example JavaScript, TypeScript um, and such always use uh, this to denote that something is not equals then we of course have the, the simple less than and greater than uh, and then uh, we of course have uh, greater less than or equal and greater than or equal which looks the same Oops. so they are somewhat uh, self-explanatory we can quickly make a test case uh, var I'm sorry, um, int var 1 is equal to let's say 1 and oops, there is a typo and var 2 is equal to also 1 var 3 is equals var 1 equals equals var 2 Oops. and this will just do a comparison as already said so this is as simple as it gets and 
uh, where such comparisons are often used is when you want to create some conditions for your code to branch uh, to that you would then also want to com combine multiple of su such operations with each other and intuitively intuitively you could say okay then you just take the result of this operation the result of yet another operation they they always evaluate to 0 or 1 uh, they technically of course use at least a uh, character to store the data because that's the smallest unit that um, you can use um, for a variable you cannot define a one bit variable um, on the level of a C of the CPU there are tricks how you can use a C to uh, create variables in C which have only one byte but effectively they will be mapped on a much bigger uh, variable so uh, access to it will be a bit uh, more complicated um, and need more c computing power so if you want to it to be fast you just stick with using uh, one entire byte to just represent to basically just use one bit from the whole byte um, so as I wanted to say one thing one might think about is to just combine uh, such the results of these operations with our logical operations so we have an and we have an or and that would work but there is something uh, much better at least more convenient the other the non bitwise logical the non bitwise logical operators which are look quite the same double and is end um, double or is and we have um, also a negation it is just an exclamation mark <coughs> so the way they work is they don't evaluate individual bits within a uh, variable within a register but they just evaluate is the entire register 1 or 0 or rather is the entire register 0 or something else so I if you have uh, if you would store a, a number 2 or any other number that is non zero into a register this register will evaluate as true no matter what number it is only if it's uh, 0 it will evaluate to 0 and of course the result of the opera of all those operations is um again a char which only uh, contains one uh, where only one bit is used to store 0 or 1 so we can quickly demonstrate this also. Um, so let's define int bar 1 is equals 2, and bar 2 is equals 2, and bar 3 is equals 1, and bar 4 is equals, uh, let's say 1 again, and then bar 5 will be equals um, bar 1 equals equals bar 2. Oops. Var not car or not var three equals equals var four. So this this part effectively is the same as doing that. It's just written differently, and in this case, um, these operations of course also just result in a zero or one. So you could just use a bitwise operator but as soon as you would really want to work with va variables which might contain uh, other things you just use these operations here an interesting uh, side note is that if you would use um, int var 6 is equals um, exclamation mark exclamation mark variant 1 for example like a double, neg oops, double negation then here uh, var 6 will just become is equals uh, 1 so th first we check I is it not 0 then we get one, uh, wait so first first we check basically if you have two exclamation marks they kind of negate what was done bitwise but since the, the results of the operations are al always only setting the, the lowest order bit then you can use uh, this trick to reliably cast any to or rather say, let's say it differently to reliably test whether a variable is not zero and usually when you would be just writing C code that would not necessarily be always important but um, if you write C++ code then compilers might complain if you would be assigning for example a variable of type in64 to a, a boolean or to a character 
simply because if you're just doing the assignment you might lose the higher, higher order bits R rather you will always use, uh, lose them but you might not care about it the compiler doesn't know so it will assume that there is something wrong um, and if you use this double exclamation marks then you just say to the compiler I just want to have a 1 if the thing contains something that's not 0 um, <coughs> and of course you could um, use the and as well you can make a arbitrary complicated um, operation so yeah and there is let's see did I forget anything? Nope. there is one more operator which is quite interesting uh, before we continue to the other ones uh, this is the so-called trinary operator um, and the way it works is zack, you have some condition. So first you have some variable that will um, contain the get the result. Let's make an. Let's first just write it down like this. Across and then we make the example. So the trinary operator is made up basically out of two operators. And one is equals one hundred. Five two is two hundred. And then uh, we also make a var one and two. Uh, one and two, which is one and uh, two, and in test is equals. And the way it works, we have first a condition, so var one greater var two. For example, you can have here any condition. You can have, can have a very complex expression with logical operations, and so on. Then we have an exclamation, uh, question mark, and then you can have an a equation. Uh, let's type again. And which will represent your return value. So basically, if the condition is true, then the equation which is provided after the question mark will be returned as the return value for test. But if the condition you provided is false, then th it skips ahead and then it returns um, val 2 plus 2. Well, it returns whatever equation is here. We could put it in brackets but it, this is not enough to, to do it on its own. And at this point when we take a look into the code uh, a typo somewhere, var4 uh, we use var4, this should be var5 um, but we don't need this breakpoint so here we see already a conditional branching. So we first have move a value to our register then we compare the value in the register with another var value in memory and depending on the result of this comparison so this CMP command we can take a look here in uh, registers when we step over it one step loaded the value into one register the next step changed here the various flags which we have um, in the CPU and now depending on the value of this fla flag field the um, jump less equal opcode will only then execute a jump if the comparison of the two numbers to each other was less than equal so the way this uh, this opcode works is it takes two integer numbers it compares them and then it stores individual bits into the uh, flag field which then represent the result of the operation and one bit can be for it was uh, less another one it w is for it was equal another one is for it is greater and so on and the jump less or equal instruction will only then perform a jump so a jump means it doesn't execute the code the next line and the, or, or rather the next opcode and next opcode but it goes to a predefined offset so in, in this way in this case this is quite a simple um, jump because it just takes a relative offset so we have this instruction pointer here which before was pointing here and then uh, I guess it was moved by probably 10 characters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 the jump was here and we have here by 16 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 16, well it was, it moved by 17, so there uh, will be some additional offset added to that but in principle uh, we can um, test how such things would look, there is a 
online assembler, which is quite useful. Uh, um, you can I will p post the link to the chat as well. So you can use it to disassemble or assemble short co code pieces. So we can, for example, just take these two bytes. Then we go to the disassemble. We tell it that it's 64 bit disassemble, and then we get a result. So here it it's it says jump plus equal, and it jumps by um, 18. So we can then take this put it here and then check how the thing wi would look if we specify different uh, values. So jump zero kind of just gave us a lot of zeros and a much longer encoding, so this is probably not what we can try jump one, two, uh, three. Okay, in this case it always compiles it, but which We'll be changing always one of the variables. Ah, it, it's 64 bit. It well, that, sh that should be fine. Let's go again with 12. 12 should be compiled correctly. It kind of cho here always chooses a different binary representation than what we fed it, so that doesn't kind of work out as I wanted. The idea basically is that you can compare when you change values here with what your output is, and then you can kind of learn where, where the where the output maybe it doesn't like it. let's go with this representation nope mm. it should be working better why is this not working um usually this set works for me quite well and I can just spe specify values and then it will always um, pre present you the, the machine code output, but for some reason here it always assumes zero. Um, it might not like the encoding. Um, doesn't like the register. Um, I mean we could just use uh, J JMP, which is just a uh, unconditional jump. Let's see if this works. Um, 16. Okay, the website is broken. Um, sorry about that. It should encode uh, the offset we want to uh, from now to to jump to in the uh, bytes here, but for some reason it's not not working anymore. Um, when we of course would here have different code, then it would uh, change this, but we don't have here a easy compiler. Let me quickly look for a different uh, online assembler. Shell stone, that's a good one. Let's try this one. Okay, this is an other one which hopefully is more reliable. Um, and it supports much more uh, platforms, so we go to 32, uh, so 64 bit x86. Uh, jump 10. Right, that works fine. Uh, what is what is jump less or equals zero uh, x twelve, right? And it provides us the output we have. So seven uh, e ten. This is what we have uh, here. Seven e ten. And if we change the jump, for example, to just jump to zero. Okay, jump to zero doesn't kind of work. A jump to probably three. Yeah. So um, you need to enter a value which is relative to the instruction pointer, but not something that would still put you within your um, actually executed in instructions. Since this uh, instruction is three characters, uh, sorry, two characters long, the smallest jump value you could specify would be three, and then it kind of here just you uh, enters you a one. So if you go to thirteen decimal. That would then go to B, and if you go to uh, one three, this should uh, sorry uh, zero x one three. That should give you here a uh, right. We have to zero zero x uh, one two. Then it will give you here uh, a jump by ten. And at some point, if we add a bigger number, 
it will change the representation of the instruction so as you see it now looks quite different and it adds an entire 32-bit number so here now we, we, we can have a jump offset of uh, plus minus 4 gigabyte uh, sorry plus minus 2 gigabyte um, which is uh, usually for most applications enough you usually won't need to jump uh, further than that if you would need to make a, a relative jump bigger than this you would need to craft it by hand using the uh, instruction uh, instruction pointer register um, so that much to this and I will put this then as a link since the other one didn't work uh, it's r it's really nice to play around and see how the, the code changes so if you want to handcraft some code this is a very useful tool um, I'm sure there is also like some uh, offline version of that but um, I just am using this for convenience uh, right and as we have anyhow coming back to our code as we have seen here after the comparison and this jump less equals we skipped this whole code block here and go went directly to this move instruction if we would change the condition here to um, I don't know, to the opposite uh, then the behavior would be of course different we still load, compare but, but now we have a different comparison jump greater equal and if we now execute it step by step we see that the jump instruction didn't do anything because the condition was not met instead we are executing the first code block and what we then do is we have here an unconditional ju jump so let's do that and the unconditional jump brings us here which is the same point we would arrive if we would have taken the other branch and then we just store the result uh, as we already have done before um, using this trinary operator I would recommend to use um, at, at least for the last value brackets because um, while it's def defined somewhere w within the language what's the order of how the operators are applied um, I would usually just only want to rely on the order of, mathema of mathematical operators because that's always universal while um, for example logical operators might be defined differently in different languages which priority they have so um, in this case using bracket just to be safe is I think a good practice okay and uh, before we s uh, make the jump to the um, flow control let's quickly take a look on some convenience operators which are also available they are well as the name says convenient they are plus plus and minus minus Oops. so uh, what one would kind of do by hand, for example, would be um, int var 1 is equals 1 and then if, oops, if you want to increment this by 1 you would write int var 1 is, in, is equals int var 1 plus 1 and you need to type a lot uh, or let's, yeah. what you can do instead is you can just write and done so you saved uh, kind of like 5 characters here and with minus this works the exact same way uh, there is however a um, catch to a trick let's say to this because what you can also write is also you can write uh, plus plus far one and these two uh, usages are not uh, equi equivalent so here uh, oops, int test one is equal to this and here let's do it with test two test two it also starts with one uh, sorry, var2 and then we make test2 test2 and the way this works is both after we are done, so here our var1 will be equals equals uh, 2 uh, that should be var2 and here our var2 will also be equals equals 2 but what is different is what uh, the value of test1 will be in this case, uh, the value of test 1 will be uh, 1 while in the latter case, the value of test 2 will be 2 so the way uh, this works is kind of here it first takes the value for return, then it increments and that's it, and in this case it just increments and then just returns the, the resulting value and 
these two different operators are quite useful when crafting various loops. Um, so you th there can uh, s um, use write less code than what you would need if you would not use them. So they are quite quite convenient. Um, here we can of course uh, right. So if you would want to write this like one by one, then here the code, the equivalent code, would be. Uh, like so first test one is equals variable, then test is equals test plus one, and for the other one the equivalent code would be we we do this and then we do that. So it kind of just changes the order of operations of the equivalent code, whether I use it before or after the variable name. And since it was so convenient, there. It's quite a bunch more of other convenient operations because this only gives you like plus one or minus one. That is kind of boring. You might want to have plus two or maybe something other. So you have the uh, oops, oops. the combined assignment operator. So uh, they are not as flexible, but from for half the use cases they are good enough. Plus equals. Add and add and assign <coughs> minus equals subtract and assign and of course the rest works the same. So we have a multiplication, division, and mod oops, division and modular division. Multiply, divide, and modulo. So. Um obviously um having a variable let's start again with test one test one um plus equals one is equivalent to just um same as var plus plus and what you don't what you cannot do is you cannot y implement this lower this latter case here with these operations. But for everything else you can use them and as you see in comparison to this, this still saves you a lot of typing plus it gives you the ability to reuse any number you want. And often when doing things you might um, want to do such uh, operations of this kind and also it's quite good to note that these operations are more aligned with how the at least x86 CPU internally executes things. So if you if we go um, this route, then uh, if the code is not optimized, it might require more registers than using this. We could actually uh, take a look in it just for comparison. So we uh, write this and then we write our var uh, plus plus. And then we'll compare how the different. Need something to the breakpoint at. How they are implemented. Although, of course, optimization might struck and the demo might not be ideal, so the thing, uh, okay, let's add here two, so that we have something, now let's go, go with a number that it cannot reasonably optimize, four, five, yeah, five is an odd enough number that will not be optimizable away. So in, as you see, this case, oops, this case, and this case, in the end has been implemented uh, the same way. Uh, we load the value, we add a value, and then we store it again. While th this one was implemented using the increment instruction, which explicitly increments just by one. So, as you see here, you could save one byte in your code if you would only need increment by one, because here you could, of course, use this add instruction and here have the value zero one. <coughs> we can actually try this with our now working online assembler. So this compiles as expected and if we add one this compiles just to one and it needs more uh, memory than using the increment opcode. Um, we can of course make this a bit more complicated uh, can make this let's say um, modular 2 uh, times equals to Let's see if this will bring, uh, give us any advantages. It 
well it doesn't really optimize the code it always loads it and then starts it back to memory so if you would compile this in a release period but we won't do that because this is more uh, unpleasant to debug um, in principle it should be able to optimize the code uh, like this much more well slightly more efficiently although if it's smart enough it probably will be smart enough to change this representation to this when it notices it so what we also could do is uh, we could try doing like this we just need the uh, brackets right and let's see if now we see a difference in how it was implemented okay so here again we s we start we load uh, the, the variable from var1 then we load the address okay it's it's actually using the load address instruction to perform the operation this is kind of um <laughs> Uh, smart, but not really what one would want to demonstrate. Um, it shows what I already said before that um, there are multiple ways how you can uh, achieve the same thing um, without, uh, well, using uh, achieve the same thing using x86 instructions. In this case, this really is kind of um <laughs> fine because basically the way it works is this: we we, we store in a EAX. We can put a breakpoint. Now we can. Um, it stores in EAX the value of of, of our var1 and then what it does is it uses this, this, this load address instruction which apparently allows you to get um, the value from EAX add it to EAX okay because I did plus 2 and then add uh, the sum of 2 and 5 so it kind of what it did is um, it made var1 plus var1 plus 5 times 2 <laughs> but, but 5 times 2 is encoded here as 10 because it's already an executed operation so let's break it let's go with um, let's go with 3 I don't think you can have 3 registers invoked in your load address instruction so going with 3 registers right now we have what we wanted um, now it's doing it like the boring way it loads the value it adds 5 to the value, then it makes integer multiplication with the value, and then it stores the value again. Um, yeah, And here it kind of just, just broken, so again we have just the um, add, and we have this additional one store operation, but for example we notice that it does not load the value again, it kind of here remembers mm -hmm. that the value was already in uh, EAX, so it can just continue with the operation and uh, store again. If the code would be optimized then uh, it would uh, remove this line and then it would look like the code at the top. Uh, so it is um, yeah it's it's always exciting to see what code the compiler will come up when it uh, <laughs> tries to optimize things. Um, okay and I think at this point we already had uh, almost everything related to variables. There are just two two very small things that are worth mentioning. First of all, um, when you have variables and you want to define some special value, so let's say you want to have a status and the status says um, ready, not ready, or completed or, or something, then you could of course just remember that zero means uh, not ready, one means ready, and two means completed, but that's of course very not user-friendly. What you could do is you could define a const variable like we did uh, somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. For example here, and so let's make this as an example. Could have defined like uh, my, state, my state one is one, my state two is two, and so on. And then when you write your own code, and then you have somewhere int uh, coin state is equals state one. Then the code is already quite readable because you can pick a label for your state, which is quite quite understandable. You could use the preprocessor so as well, but that's a mechanism which we will take a, a look at uh, a bit later. So um, there is another way you can do it in C and many other languages. Namely, you can um, instead of kind of having to define helper variables, which might be quite messy, what you can do and what is the recommended thing to do is to use a enum. Oops. 
So, enum, my enum. It's kind of already a very basic uh, sort of object that um, we will kind of, at least it is defined like an object, although it's not really an object. It is uh, just a collection of values. My enum zero is equals zero. It kind of works the same way like you would do with the const variables, just that it, is, it has some convenience function. So of course you can define values manually, but you can also let it auto increment. Oops, comma. If you just don't specify a value, two, uh, three, four, five, six, it will. When you look here in the intelligence, it tells you which num number it would be. It would auto increment for you, which is already quite nice. And you can of course then define um, some other value from which then it will again start auto incrementing. So now it will increment to eleven and so on. So. Um, and then also have like let's say 22 and whatever you want. So this 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 is just a label. You can use any name that would be valid uh, for a, a variable um, as a label here in the enum. And you can also ha have a enum uh, class. This is something that is not kind of um, used in just C. It's only used in C++. Uh, customary and the difference uh, we will take a look at in a second so let's just first define it as a normal enum oh and one, one more thing if you just define an enum like this it will be um, usually 32 bit characters but you can te tell it uh, to just use a char or you could specify it to be a um, short so if you know what the range of your enum will be you can um, tell the compiler to use a smaller data type to save on memory so um, and now if we make a variable and you can use this enum name. Oops, there's a typo here. Enum. You can use this enum name as a type. So my and you can assign uh, directly one of your enums to it. So you can basically create your own set of values which have labels and then a type which then takes such um, labels instead of numbers, which is quite uh, quite convenient. Um, can assign whatever you want, my enum my enum one, my enum two. Um you can use uh, the enums to compare something, so int uh print, let's say uh enum one is equals equals uh something, let's say four. Um and so on. But you could of course try to like let's say mm, 11 and depending on your compiler settings this uh, might uh, or might not work normally it will work but if you define this as class then it should not work and you also need to specify then the namespace for your enum so if you define an enum as enum class you need to prepend your labels with the name of the enum which is actually quite nice because in this case you can have uh, have in your enums um, if you have like two or three enums in the same namespace, you can then each enum could have like a field called undefined, which if you would have an enum not as class, but in all of them in the same namespace, then the labels are directly available in your top namespace. And then of course you cannot reuse a label that another enum is using. And another change here with the enum class is that uh, it will no longer allow you by default to compare to a uh, just an integer number or to an integer value as such. So we will comment this out. Um, yes, and uh, last thing with regard to types, um, what you can do is you can define your own types, which like or, or let's say your own type aliases. With the machine types, this is kind of not very interesting, but with more complex types, which we will uh, take a look um, in one of the later lectures, this becomes actually quite useful. So. Um, Type def, then you specify which type you want. For example, on signet in 64. I mean, this one is already quite long and unpleasant to type. So let's call it in 64t. And voila! Now you can use in 64t as a type. I long int is equal to zero. And effectively, the compiler just knows. Okay, if you use in 64t, then it needs to place this type here in for you. This helps with code readability with uh, very long types and 
also in such cases I think it's much more convenient to have just a u int instead of typing unsigned each time that is quite a um, <laughs> improvement and the last thing about variables I think which uh, is very important is um, if you have a variable of a given type how can you uh, convert it to a variable of some other type so type casting the process is called type casting and it allows you to do just that and oops. so let's create a int var 1 is equals seven eight and then let's make a short variable var 2 so this one is only 16 bit this, oops, bit but this one was 32 bit and in principle if we want we can just write var2 is equals uh, var1 and depending on our er warning settings this will either be accepted as is or it will create a warning uh, if you want to just see the compiler output uh, build here it did not warn us so let's uh, change the warning level to 4 and build again well it, co it warns us about many things um, that for some reason th this did not warn us here that we are losing data it should uh, it should warn us normally because in this case when you do this operation what you will end up in your uh, var2 oops var2 will be just the lower order bits of our um Um, it should be warning. I have no idea why it doesn't want. I think wait, we can try. Uh, there is one more level, like warning all. Let's see if then it will warn us. It still doesn't. Um, that's a fail on the compiler side. It should create a warning here, and usually, it also does. It must maybe because we are not using this for anything later on. It kind of. Um, so if this is create. What the if is we will see in a second. I just want to test this whether it will give us a warning if we actually use the value for something. No, it's not giving us a warning. Um, it should. It really should because, um, as mentioned here, you are losing data because you are truncating the size of the variable. Um, and normally, what you would do. If the compiler gives you a warning and you want the compiler to not warn you about it, kind of tell it, okay, I know, I know what I'm doing, it's fine. Then you specify uh, the type you want to cast something to in brackets, and then uh, within reason the compiler should not provide any warnings. Um, so if you don't tell it how to do the cast, it's a implicit cast, and if you tell it how to cast, it's an explicit cast, and you can uh, of course use. Um, such uh, casting to assign variables uh, b between different types. Uh, one. So here, for example, we can assign a double from an integer, and this uh, works just fine. Um, we can also do the same thing uh, from a float. So we should in initialize this with something. And of course, when you do it, it will uh, truncate it, so you will not get the decimal points. It will just give you the integer uh, part of the number. And internally the way this works is it uses a specialized instruction which takes the values from one register type, converts them and puts them into another register type. If you are using types which are stored in different registers. We can take a look on that. Uh, well, actually, we don't need an assignment since we are overwriting it, but well, uh, it's fine. Let's run it. And here we see yeah, that's not where we want it to be. This and here we were at the wrong breakpoint. So, let's again. Uh, so, we see there is this CVTSI2DS. So, convert type signed integer to signed uh, double. And <laughs> the instruction first. Um, takes one register, so the target register, and you can specify and give it a memory address directly, so it will uh, not require you to first load it into an 
other register explicitly. If this would be a reduced instruction set like ARM, you would need to first load it, then convert it, and then you could store it to another memory location as we do here. So move, uh, sign double, and again, again um, we have our uh, address and the register from which we want to save the data. And what one could do in principle is instead of using specialized instructions for converting the very incompatible binary representation of the numbers to each other, do the following. We could, um, so this will kind of um, be a bit, include something that we'll learn a bit later, uh, that being pointers, but since we already kind of um, talked about pointers with regard to the uh, base pointer register and how the memory is uh, managed um, in the last lecture, I think this is okay to already now kind of take this future p future knowledge and um, present it. Let's call it variable 6. And what we do now is, um, first we'll be using the, let's do it step by step. So, um, when this is a double, a double asterisk is a, p a pointer on the double. So, the pointer on the double, so the double basically is a variable which, re which, which, which represents itself. It, it has its own value and that's it. A pointer is just a variable of type integer which contains a memory address. And in this case th we will want to give this variable the memory address of our variable 3. We can do this with this um, end operator or the reference operator that gives us the address of the variable in memory instead of giving us its content. And when we have this address of this variable what we can do is we can um, create a pointer to an integer. So let's call it uh, int asterisk. Oh, that must be a in 64 since double is of course 64 bit. Um, and at this point, I think this would be nicer if I make the example with a float because this we would need for your later um, for the for the homework that was assigned. So let's let's go with a uh, float. So we take var 3, then we have the integer, which um, we'll call uh, var5. Uh, right, we have a pointer to an integer. Which in this case, under the hood is kind of the same thing, because it's in both cases a 64-bit integer. Whether it's a 64-bit integer or a pointer to a 64-bit integer, it, it uses the same registers, just that uh, the meaning of the content of the registers is different. And then we will use the cast function. So we could of course try this, but this is something that it does not even allow us to do. So it's not like that, that it would just create a warning, but here it just really says that the types are incompatible. It c you cannot auto um, um, you cannot implicitly cast a uh, float asterisk onto a uh, in 64 asterisk, but as we already learned, we can just force it to just by specifying which cast we want in the brackets and then the compiler will do it even if it thinks that this makes no sense. And the last step here in our operation will be to to get the value, so we call it um, in 64. Uh, Alright, we can use normal int now because it's the float, so let's quickly switch to float. So int uh, uh, 6, uh, this should also be called p, well actually this is still a pointer, so let's yeah, uh, 6 and this now we can use the just the asterisk, which normally is a multiplication, but if it is used in comparison in com in connection with a variable name without having an operand like this, it means that you want the value at this address and not the address itself. So now when we here add something, we can break on, for example, a zero assignment. Then we will see. That so our vari vari variable four contains well a approximate rounded representation of the number we wanted here. You can already see that a uh, thirty-two bit floating point number is not very precise, since even one to three point four is kind of rounded to one to three point four four zero 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 two. But if we now kind of want to uh, see what now the representation here is, is we really get some odd hexadecimal representation. And the idea for the homework is that 
you can use this trick to get the the individual bits from your floating point number and then you can use um, the bitwise operators which we have taken a look at earlier to um, extract the, the first bit then the next seven bits and so on um, so this uh, should allow uh, you to um, do the homework I think with with, whatever, wi with what we had here um, and maybe just to and as I, I said doing it with a double is optional but one more thing uh, what we can maybe add is um, so a homework one and here uh, also it would be nice if we would have a function uh, so given a given comma assembly float number so basically just to the opposite so first you have a float number then you take it apart into this free con 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 if, if constituting integers and the next task will be take any given of these free constituting integers and then make a floating point number out of it and of course um, uh, uh, implement test cases test so whenever you submit homework it would it is really important that uh, the program can be run so you submit the source code I, I compile them and the source code should test itself so not just submit a function and say okay this should do what what was uh, assigned but uh, you should have like a main function in which um, you could have programmed a couple of examples and it will and this way one can easily validate whether it's doing what it was supposed to do so that's why the test cases are for and um, yeah that's that so right so we are here we had our trick here so we can write actually down what we get In this case uh, two equals this and if we would want to take a look what this would be in here let's go if we want to look can I enter this thing? Um, one, two, three point four. One, two, three point four. Why isn't it typing? Okay, I cannot change this side. I can change this one. And one, uh, one, two, three point four. Uh, so um, it kind of is again <laughs> rounded, but we can just write this down so that you have a reference for the first uh, example which I provided what this should be so uh, sign is oops sign is 0 exponent is 133 and mantisa is uh, this Okay, uh, and we can also represent this as hex. Um, ignore changes. So the hex representation of Mantisa is this. The hex representation of this will be ignore changes. Uh, this we can ignore this, and of course zero is zero, and you see that kind of most of the number which you had here is overlapping except for the uh, 7 here because like at least one bit from this thing is used already for the exponent and the whole thing then um, is also shifted by one bit so um, yeah that's that um, let's see if there is anything worth mentioning right there's one more thing I should mention uh, which will help you with the assignment uh, that is what you can do with the bitwise operators. Uh, where were we? Bitwise, 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 bitwise operators. Here we have them. Um, that is, you can um, use them to set uh, easily, at, uh, at least somewhat easily, individual uh, bits. So we had the shift operators, but let's now um, 
use uh, individual bits as flags. So if you, for example, have a lot of parameters where you just want to have a 1 and a 0 and that's all the extent of values that you kind of really require, then um, what you can do is you can just define um, char b flag 1 oops, null b uh, flags flag. and always use just one bit for any given flag uh, of course needs different numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 and then you can instead of having like for example in this case 4 um, character char type variables where each variable either just stores a 1 or a 0 you can use one variable for all of them and then just set or clear individual flags so of course you can uh, char f test um, use uh, the normal operations to combine some of the flags so let's say we want to set the, f the first flag and the fourth flag you so just use the or operation and voila you already have your flags and then um, Let's say we want to set one more flag to the variable, to the flag field, so to say. We already have seen the um, this operator, so uh, right. <laughs> Did I mention that this also exists um, uh, somewhere at the top? I told you that you can use this with. Did I write it them down? Right here, uh, and. Uh, Instead of just writing all of them down, I just write that you can also use bitwise operators, bitwise binary operators as well here. Uh, so you can then just, for example, set flag number two. And oops. and of course, the question is how would you clear a flag? So how you remove a bit from your uh, bit field? Adding is it. Adding it is easy, removing it is also, also quite easy. You take your bit field, then use the end operator, and of course the assignment to make it convenient. And then what you can do is you can use the tilde operator, which creates an inverse. Then we can clear the flag number two. So what this basically is equivalent to is flag is equals flag and flag two. So one 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 zero one, and then it will clear only the one bit you want to clear. It will not do anything with all the other bits, and uh, such tricks in combination with bit shifts allows you to basically extract not just a single bit but any amount of bits from one number and then do something with it uh, in another number. Uh, you can of course also set and clear mul multiple flags if you just um, combine them together with let's say flag 4 Oops. so here this way you could c uh, set or clear two flags at the same time uh, right which shifts we already had um, Right, and one more thing to be most explicit about how such things work, masking. Um, let's say we have a bit pattern um, char uh, f test 2, let's call it p test 2 for pattern 0p, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. One one, right. Um, so in this case, uh, what we have learned from casting further down, um, if you would want to, well, in this case it's difficult. But let's say you want you are only interested in the lower bits, so only in this four. So you could do test uh, test uh, L for lower part, and then just use the end operator. 0 x 0 f and you are masking out all the lower order bits so effectively this one is is equals this um, and 0 b 0, 1 2 3 4 1 2 3 4 so the bits which are contained in the lower part are maintained as they are so having a 0 1 still gives you a 0 but all the bits in the upper part 
if they are ended with uh, ended, yeah, ended with zero, um, then they will be cleared. So this one goes away, and any other one would also go away. And if you want to do the opposite, uh, so per test h higher part, then right, right, right. Just for simplicity, let's use here the variable. Then you can just here have f zero. So we just move the ones here. And then the result of this is of course um null x sec and the result of the other one is null x one two three one one two three four. And the last thing what you can do or what you should do, let's call it L H underscore, is you might want to have your uh highest highest order nibble. Um in the lowest order position after this operation. So you would just take this thing, so which let's use the one H with the underscore. And then you just shift it by four. So uh, then what you get out of this will be this. Although here you would need to take care to ensure that um Let's make all of them unsigned to be on the safe side. Because in the other case, if that one would be a one, then oops, a one, then the shift here would uh, no. Actually, let's see. Yeah, if that one would be a one, then the shift would be a, would cause troubles. Um, so as you see, with such um, tricks using bitwise operators, you can really very target in a very targeted way access any amount of bits inside one single variable. Of course this adds a lot of code, uh, so sometimes it might be more beneficial to just have a lot of status fields which um, just hold a 0 or 1, um, but this is then always something for, for the trade-off um, and depends very much on the actual situation which you are handling. So, um, as I mentioned I think during the last lecture, in the past people would try to use as little memory no matter how much more they need to compute, while nowadays um, people would try to compute as little as possible and uh, use as much memory as possible because it's always easier to add more memory nowadays. Um, yeah. Also one other thing to say, if you kind of want to save memory, uh, it also depends on, it might it adding more compute might end up uh, still using up more memory if the size of your code grows. So you can have the situation where you optimize the amount of memory needed uh, for your data but at the cost of growing the size of your code that will be executed. And for example, if you are using um, an Arduino or any of these other very small microcontrollers which are so popular with home home making, uh, ho with makers at home and also which are quite nice to use at, uh, at um, in labs for different uh, applications because they are simply uh, very easy to use document, etc. They uh, have a architecture where they not don't have like one one memory so on a computer, everything that you are executing, all your code and all your data are stored in the same RAM. And you just load the, the stuff from disk. On the Arduino, uh, on well, it depends of course on which uh, Arduino you have in particular, but usually they have uh, built-in memory, they have RAM, and they have a built-in flash memory. And the code can be directly executed from the flash memory. And you have usually um, much more flash memory, like a couple kilobytes or even a megabyte maybe with a bigger controller and just one kilobyte or four kilobyte of RAM. So in such a case the trade-off to reduce the amount of memory that your data takes is very much worthwhile even if your code gets bigger because you have much more room to store your code. On a old DOS computer from 20 years ago, since everything needs to fit into the same RAM, that would not be uh, necessarily a beneficial trade-off. So optimizing is always a very individualized uh, way. Okay, um, I think this is everything that is worth saying at this level about variables. So we can continue uh, to the next part, uh, namely the uh, control flow. Uh, since this, since we should do some short break at some point, I think um, this is a good uh, time to make a five-minute break. If you have any questions, you can ask them. If not, um, we will continue after five minutes uh, with the control flow um, project.
Yes, I hear you. Um, it's always available. You go on debug, then Windows, and then wait. Ah, right. I, the pro the project needs to be running. I just noticed it myself that I couldn't access it either. Uh, you need to uh, run the project, and when it is running, then you c you have all the other options. So it's always switching the views between the developer development view and the uh, debug view. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I think the five minutes are ending, so <coughs> let's continue. So we will um, save this and create a new project. Create new project. Console application. Control flow. Create. Okay, we can remove whatever we don't need, and let's start. So, as we have seen already with the trinary operator, the CPU is capable of um, choosing which instructions it will execute next, at least within certain um, constraints. And um, this um, functionality is very important uh, for any program to be able to uh, be flexible. Um, 
is a pa fa feature which pretty much any every computer since the very early days of computing uh, could um, perform. Like the basically, if you cannot change your control flow, then you don't have really a computer, but just a big calculator. And um, m most, I uh, can't The thing that makes computers so powerful is their ability to change the way they are executing code and change and decide which code to execute. This gives them uh, very um, a huge potential to perform any computation imaginable uh, within uh, what is computable and um, generally it enables them to emulate each other. So if you have this ability you can um, for example if you would have ARM code and just an x86 CPU you could write a program that can read the ARM code and then execute it in software step by step. Uh, this feature is called uh, Turing Completeness, so any programming language which um, is Turing Complete can in principle emulate any other uh, machine that is um, also a computer. What you cannot do is you cannot simulate a quantum computer with a classical computer. This doesn't work, but you can simulate any classical computer with any other classical computer of course given enough memory if you run out of memory then you cannot do that but if you have enough memory then uh, this will always work and um, let's start with a very simple example of the con of control flow so we already had something similar but let's start test we need some variable because it the computer needs um, something to decide what it should do next so let's give it a variable uh, variable which has some value, then, then let's give it another vari variable Just minus one and as we have seen with this trinary operator we could already do something and in this case for example what we can do is we can write if so a condition test var is equals equals one to three so we want to test if our variable is equals one to three and if it is um, and if it is, then we set our return variable to be 1. And the way you write, the way this, the syntax in C++ uh, and C works is you write your condition. It needs to be enclosed in brackets. There are some languages where you could write a condition like this. For example, in Go you can do it, you can do it also in uh, MATLAB script. But um, this is kind of ugly. So um, I like the C++ version where you need to put it, it in brackets uh, much more. And of course um, in JavaScript, Java, um, TypeScript and many other languages it's the same thing. And after your condition you have um, you can pr uh, provide a statement, an expression which then will be evaluated if the condition is true. And if in this case it's a one-liner but if you would have more lines which you want to be evaluated uh, executed, then what you can do is you can just create a block with curly brackets and then basically your expression to be evaluated when this is true will be the entire code block however many lines it may might contain. If it contains only uh, one line then it's equivalent to not being in a block but if you need more lines you can just create a block. And another very nice feature here is that you can also you don't need to, if you want to do something if this is not true, you don't need to make um, another if and then say, let's say this is zero. Um, but what you can do is you can just use else and this way you don't need to do the same comparison again. So definition says you have your if, then you have a statement which can be a co code block and then you can have an else followed by another statement or code block. And the else code block will be executed when whatever condition you have here is false. And here you can have a very complex expression. You can have a complex equation which computes something and then checks if it's greater or equal something else, whatever you want. You can use logical operators to uh, combine different conditions with each other. Then the whole thing must evaluate to true for the expression here to be true. And what you can also do is you can kind of take an if and then just paste it again and then what you get is an else if and in some computing languages this thing is written like this it's kind of an own explicit thing but in C it's because C kind of takes whatever is the next expression as um, as is without much uh, <laughs> complaining you can just write else if 
with this and the code intern the compiler internally does not even need to explicitly have like a support for an else if scenario and the else if basically is works like this so if this is true then this is done and if this is not true oops, then it evaluates the next else if so here we could have a condition so let's say something more complex oops. Um, or that and the one will the first one will be test var is equals four five six or it's equals seven eight nine and we could also add maybe a um oops or uh this is in principle we I'm putting here a bit too many brackets just to be on the safe side but um you wouldn't necessarily need uh, that many brackets um so if you only have like an expression like this that should be just fine, uh, but here we want brackets because we want here another expression, so it has to be greater than a hundred and smaller than hundred nineteen and nine. Let's say, uh, you know, just to demonstrate what you can uh, type, what equations you can have, and of course, if this is true, then it will go here, and else it will do else, and you can of course, as mentioned before, take another if paste it, I mean you, you could type it, I'm just pasting it because it's convenient and have another condition, so here let's say uh, it's 111 or uh, 222 and so on and then you would assign, do something, whatever you want in this case we are assigning just different values to our return variable but we could do whatever we want, we could have a whole program written as one of the code blocks and you can have as many of these else ifs as you want um, what you can do, which is useless, but you can do it, you, s you can of course specify um, an equation which will never be fulfilled, so like this one and I don't, and in my experience the compiler will not even complain about that, let's see yep, it didn't even complain um, although here, as you see, the IntelliSense is complaining because it kind of knows that this will never be true, so perhaps you wanted to make an OR and it tells you that, so um, modern IDEs are quite helpful in finding even such uh, bugs, but on a purely se semantic level you can make conditions which will, be nev which will be never met, this is perfectly valid. You could also make like um, an if1, which always is true. Um, this is a very ugly way of disabling or enabling code blocks. <laughs> um, there is a better way using the preprocessor, which we'll uh, take a look in once we are done with the basics of uh, the C language. But um, this is something you could do in a pinch if you want to disable some code block. Usually what you would do is if you, let's say we have here, let's delete this, let's say we have this code block here, um, this branch, uh, this condition, and we want to disable it. We want this to always be first, then we just end zero. So we, we keep the code, I mean, of course we could just comment it out, oops, but if you are using like a multi-line comment, and you already have a multi-line comment here, this kind of breaks because this multi-line comment ends your other multi-line comment. So if you are using multi-line comments, then you cannot comment the code block out. And then just making everything into single-line comments is mighty tedious, although there is a hotkey for that. Uh, what was it? Control KC, no, KU, KU. So you, you control uh, so control K and C so you press control K and then you press control C but uh, so uh, right now it works uh, so if you s like not select everything then it will make a multi-line comment if you select everything it will actually make you a normal single line uh, a normal bunch of single line comments everywhere and control K U I can see them somewhere here uh, I have no idea somewhere it's Control K here comment section and comment section. Uh, so there, there, are, there is a huge amount of hotkeys. Oh, this is also a very nice one. Make everything uppercase or make everything lowercase, and so on. Um, but of course, if you would have some ID which does not have such a hotkey and you just want to disable the block and you don't want to comment everything out by hand because you have already multi-line comments, you could just make the condition to always in the end evaluate to false. And if you make a build, a release build, this would actually really just remove this code entirely from the final result because the compiler understands that this code will never be executed. In debug, I would expect this code to be mm, kept even though it would never be used. 
Um, so this is yes. Yeah. Yeah, it would. We would never, that's correct, we would never trigger this case. So we could simplify the code like this. No, it, it ignores such, it, it ignores, it doesn't even show you an intelligence error. It's completely oblivious to the fact that this, that this doesn't work. But you're right, so let's, let's do it like this. Now every line w should <laughs> work fully. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, good, so as said, this is one thing and what we will learn later is that you can use in such uh, equations also a function calls, but we are not yet at the level of doing function calls, so I am just mentioning it without uh, providing an example. And um, what you can do if you don't have complex expressions in your if, so if you would have only, if we would have simplified this to this, there is another control flow mechanism that one can use. It's called a switch. And for the switch we provide of course the variable which we want to um, base our de decisions off and then we can just specify cases. So let's say case 1, 2, 3, uh, case uh, 7, 8, 9, case uh, 4, 5, 6 and default. So if the variable is equals 1 to 3, then this case is triggered. So let's say test uh, red is equals 1. Uh, and there is a pecul peculiarity about this mechanism that if you write it like this, and then let's say here, let's say we want to have, uh, I don't know, 2. Or let's give it, yeah, let's say it's 2. Um, and then here we want to have it 3. If we would run this code as is, even if test var is 1 to 3, it would end up to be 3 because wherever we enter this case structure, the execution falls through over the label. So what we need is a break. Break tells the compiler well, to make to generate code that here at this point we will want to skip to the end of our entire switch and not execute the next line. This mechanism is in some way quite convenient, but also, so here for example, let's um, remove the break, we can test this in the debugger, then uh, this behavior is in some cases convenient if you want to have like, if a var variable is something, then do this, and the variable is uh, something else, do another f thing first, and then do this. Um, but it's also a huge uh, great source of bugs because it's easy to forget to make the break and then you are wondering why your code is uh, is returning always 3 and not and never 2 <laughs> in this case so um, this is something to keep in mind that you always need to make these breaks and for example in other languages like C sharp that was changed such that um, by default if you don't specify break uh, the compiler will just uh, throw a compiling exception and you need to explicitly specify a fall through and then the, ne the next label name to which it should fall through so um, it makes it kind of less convenient but on the other hand much more er error proof and of course we have this default label which as the name says is, that is just the case which will be triggered if none of the above cases is true and the order is also kind of uh, arbitrary, so if we put it like this, it will also work. So default does not need to be last, but if it's not last, then you would need to uh, give it a break as well. Um, the main limitation of such of the switch is that in C++ it only works with machine types, so basically with integer numbers, um, while in other languages like C# -sharp, um, or, or if we would be using um, an if a lot of ifs, then we could compare complex types and uh, here we only can use numbers and of course enums since enums are numbers. But for example if we would have a string and would want to compare a, um, a string to some reference string, you can do it with ifs, but you cannot do it with a switch. A switch will, on, will in this case fail. In C-sharp um, they implemented 
they define the language such that this is working but there the string is a kind of part of the basic types that this language supports and since the language is uh, not uh, one that is compiled directly to machine code but uh, only to a intermediate representation which is then is interpreted they can m more or less the invent arbitrary types uh, arbitrary types which they can then handle within the s syntax of their language like a machine code like a machine type without uh, the actual machine being able to understand or do something with that type um yeah that's that so um that much to this uh, switch. Um, switches are quite useful if you f want to, for example, con convert um, enums to strings. So f you could have um, a switch, you provide it a variable of type enum that can have different labels and then in each case you would assign a resulting variable with a string that would be the textual representation. For example, if you want to print your state to the console, that would be quite a useful use case. But um, that's uh, pretty much all the ways that you have directly uh, how you can control the flow of your application. Although there is, again, with regard to function calls, one thing to be um, mentioned here, that if you have a function call within your uh, con uh, equation somewhere, um, which parts of the equation will be uh, evaluated is in fact uh, dependent on um, what input the equation has. So it's not like that it here if for example we feed it the value uh, 111 and it sees that this is true and it knows the whole equation is true then it will not make this comparison anymore. So if this would be a function call if the first part of your equation would be true then it would already never execute the second function call. So this is something to, to keep in mind and um, this is a way how you can also implement control flow within equations but this is kind of resulting in usually not very readable code so if you want to create normal con control flow you should just use ifs um, or switches that is uh, the right way to do it and of course the next um, sort of uh, control flow mechanisms that we might uh, want to take a look on is uh, a loop. I already mentioned loops before. Uh, it is more or less how it sounds. You have some code and then the code is ex executed in a loop multiple times. Always the same code. So let's write such a loop. Um, in C you have three, times, three types of loops. The simplest one is a for loop. You start it with a for, then you can specify a um, variable which will be your um, loop variable. You don't have to do it, you can just leave it empty and then have some other conditions. Then after semicolon you can specify a condition, so let's say i is less than 10. If you have a loop variable then you can use it. You could for example place the loop variable uh, before your loop, then you can still access the variable after your loop finished, which might be interesting in some cases. Um, you could also have here a function call that just checks something and says okay continue loop or not. For example if you are reading from the keyboard here you could read uh, check whether there, there is the already a pressed key in the buffer or whether the thing should wa wait for the next key and so on. And then you of course have a semicolon and then you have the, the third uh, entrance entry in your um, for loop which is a, co a co code piece which is executed once the loop has already executed once. So the way this works is when the loop starts it will execute the, f the initialization code block once. It will not do anything else. It will just execute this code block and then it will check whether the condition is true and if the condition is true it will proceed with executing the loop body. So let's give it something to do in m counter zero Snack, counter and we want to increment the counter each time the loop runs. So it it does this once, then it does this, then it assuming this was true as it should be for the first code, then it executes some code and then it jumps back to the beginning but then it jumps into this block where we can do something, let's say i++, plus plus, so increment i. After doing the this code block it will again evaluate the, ver the condition and if the condition is still true it will proceed executing the code block and then it will repeat the same thing. So we can uh, maybe put a breakpoint here and quickly step through our loop to see how, how this works. So, uh, alright, one more thing, we should just disable 
all the things that we disabled in the other one that makes the code more readable. Uh, we don't want this. Uh, basic runtime checks, we don't want that. And we don't want this either. Should be good enough to get readable code. Right, so we, s we have here, of course, our initialization of our counter variable. Then we start in our loop. We have the, again, here we write, uh, what, let's see if we can. That's not not really more more readable. So we put zero into our e i. Then we we make a jump to our condition. So here we have a unconditional jump. It always initializes and then jumps to the checking the condition. The condition is here, um, and then it has a conditional jump. In this case, it doesn't jump because the condition is um, still uh, true. Then we execute our code, and then at the end of the loop we have just a jump to the beginning. So th it kind of reorganizes in memory this three uh, things. So here we have like initialization, condition, increment, and here it has like um, initialization, jump to con uh, to condition, and increment is here. The reason is because the initialization is just done once, while the increment will always be inc uh, well the after the loop code, which usually is increment, will be executed each time and then we need to make the check again. So ordering the code this way saves us a unconditional jump. And then the whole thing will just repeat 10 times. We can uh, watch the register on the side. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay, that Okay, that's the tenth, so now it is ten, increment, move, compare, and now it jumped after the loop to the end portion of the code. So once uh, the condition is no longer true, it takes the other code branch and executes um, the other code, uh, which then follows the loop. Of course, one can, if one forgets to do this, uh, maneuver oneself into an infinite loop, then the loop will just run and run and run and run and run some more, and then the program is pretty much frozen forever. Uh, there are scenarios where one kind of wants to exploit the properties of an infinite loop, but then you kind of want to be able, at some point, in some way, to break out of this infinite loop. So, an example of such infinite loop would be when you want to read characters from a line and you don't know how long the line in the file will be so we have an infinite loop and then if you see inside the loop okay I read the character which is the line end then you want to break the loop and you can do it using again the break keyword so as soon as uh, break is triggered the loop will be terminated so we can for example have a condition if i is equals equals 3 so if i is 3 then we break the loop which well then we will never count to 10 but it will be fine um, or let's say if it's 9. If it, let's break it when it's 9. Um, so we can put the breakpoint here, run the code, we don't need to step for everything again. We have now, it simply is a jump uh, to after the loop. It's the same jump that we would take, the same address at least, if the condition wouldn't be true. It's the same jumping address, but of course this one is unconditional, this one is conditional. And in internally we again have ha for the if Maybe we should want to step through the if how this works. Uh, we ha we, uh, we simply do the comparison and then we make a jump non equal. Uh, not equal. Wait, what do we? Yeah, jump if not equal. So if it's not equal, we want to jump around the code block. Um, and if it would be equal, then we wouldn't take the jump and then we would end up in the break, which is a unconditional jump. And what we also can do, which is quite nice, is um, let's say if i is equals equals 3 we can use the continue oops, a keyword which will make the loop uh, kind of um, skip the whole rest of the block here and jump basically back up here to the increment and then condition and then execute the next loop so um, you could have uh, for example a loop which um, reads from a line but it should ignore let's say um, non-printable character. So we would t check whether the character is printable and if it is not printable you would continue to read the next character at some point in the next uh, loop and 
but if it's printable then you would continue to execute whatever is further down in your loop so this is quite quite a nice thing there are limitations if you would have a loop in another loop you cannot uh, break out of both with them with break so break and continue always applies only to the loop you are in right now and um, if you want to break out of a loop which um, like out of two loops you would need to use a different mechanism so we will take a look on this uh, in a second uh, but let's see quickly um, again step through uh, through the code so we already have a, our if we know how this works here it simply makes a jump directly to the incrementation po portion of our code uh, so this much uh, to for loops there are in modern uh, C++ uh, so-called range loops which um, also start with 4 but on this we will take a look once we uh, start with C++ as long as we only work with C we cannot do that because we need complex types and containers for ran ranged loops now let's uh, just take a look on other loop types although to be honest in C most of the other loop types are kind of redundant so the other one is a while loop and a while loop just has a condition while the condition is true so uh, my is um, I mistyped somewhere my counter is less than let's say 15 we will then here increment our counter so the difference here is that this is that such a while loop um, it just the condition and effectively it is just equivalent to a for loop which is written like this so let's say suck um, of course here you can also use break and continue just that if you do continue you won't won't have the block that still would be executed and also this block has limitations you cannot um, like put another semicolon there or anything this, this it will complain so you can have only very simple code here um, what you can do if I'm not wrong you can separate the code with commas which otherwise would be kind of an untypical way but here this works but only works to a certain extent. So here you could, for example, initialize uh, j is equals to. But if you would want to this be float, I think this will not. Uh, will not complain. Let's see, not, let's see if this compiles. Um, suck build. Yeah. Um, so you can Im I in initialize a second variable of the same type but you cannot initialize a second variable of a different type can you yeah even though it actually not is not underlining it it fails the compilation so this uh, separating code with commas is some is only um, possible within a certain subset of a c++ statement so you cannot have a if here either but you could have for example incrementing both variables and just separate that with a comma or or other things of this sort. So there is a small subset of things you can do uh, in addition. Or you could just here call a function which would then do a, a arbitrary amount of things of a, but then you would need to uh, define a function and we are not yet uh, far enough to define our own functions. So as I said we have this here this while loop which is pretty much just a for loop without the initialization in the increment uh, code block. And then we have another type of loop which is called a do while uh, plus plus and this condition is uh, climate 20 let's say and that's the only loop that you kind of need to terminate with a semicolon should do, by the way compile just clear the errors and the pretty much only difference between those two types of loops is that this loop will check the condition and then do something and this loop will always do something and only then check the condition so the kind kind of is a use case why why uh, where you would want to maybe use uh, this do y loop and there is actually quite a funny um, hack which you can use this uh, for you can have a do uh, while zero and then you can have a co some code here um, and when you want to abort the execution of the code and just jump to the end you can just break so this is a method that you can exploit um, with some degree of reliability to 
for example, if you would have a function where you are checking different conditions and then and if any of them is not met, you want to ignore the whole rest and then just return an error value. So you could, for example, set a return value, we have here, one here to, let's say, minus 2, and then break, and then here you'd have a return red so that you return the value from the function call. Um, but this is kind of not the way, not the thing that is recommended you use do loops for. So in C, I you will notice when you use C for uh, some time that there are many things that you can do. Some of them are not recommended and there are also um, many ways to do the same thing which on, on one hand is of course great because it makes the language very powerful but on, on the other hand it makes it also such that it might be very difficult to read someone else's code. So, um, but maybe we should just leave this here as an example. Uh, do something like um, add an if this is, I don't know, uh, great equals to and break. Do something more. And the last thing with regard to loops that is good to know is how one can uh, break out of two loops. Uh, but before we maybe take a look on this, just one more uh, control flow feature, which are labels. So you can have some some code. Um, let's say we add here a return zero, and then you can have a label. Let's call this skip label. A label is just a, a name. It follows the same conventions as variable names. It's uh, it's simply followed by a double point, and you can use the go to instruction to go to such a label. So we can try this. We just add here go to skip label. I should type it properly. Why is this complaining? <sighs> it is complaining. So the go tos are not very. Uh, pleasant. It is complaining because we have here a variable defined. So, if you want to use go tos, you should not have any variables defined outside of a scope um, after you. So between your go to and the potential jump target. So here, uh, I just moved it down and it works. And this is just as you see here a conditional jump. I'm actually not sure why it is kind of implemented twice. It's completely unnecessary, but it did uh, it for some reason and it just jumps to the label. So this uh, go to statement is a way to um, implement, to force the compiler to add a unconditional jump to some address. And since this is rather a low level operation, it also kind of fails with variable definitions in between. Um, so, but as said, you can exploit such a mechanism to um uh, you can exploit such a mechanism to uh, break out of multiple loops at the same time so let's create a loop in another loop and to not have problems with with uh, defined variables let's put everything in a code block um int test x is equal to 0 then we have for one infinite loop inside which we have another infinite loop this is kind of the same as while one. Um, right here, we would have our uh, counter plus plus, and if counter greater than thirty, then we go to go to breakout. We need to define the label. It's now complaining that it doesn't find it, and our breakout label would be here. And this way, we can terminate both loops at the same time. Um, a alternative way would, of course, be to have here a just a normal break. But then we, in the next loop, we would need to add the same condition again. Uh, right, that break should be invented. Um, but since we don't. But since we don't want redundant code, so we don't want to check twice, we just can use this trick to break out of the loop entirely. And um, maybe just one last thing to the loops um, before we return the code. Um, if we take a look on our the simplest case of our first loop, 
let's remove everything that's unnecessary. This is a comment. Then we could write this loop uh, kind of manually. Um, int i is equal to zero. Go to uh, skip. Next i plus plus skip if i is uh, equal uh, that would be the um, analog on greater equals 10 then go to done sounds my counter plus plus go to next uh, oops next and done. Uh, oops, that uh, should be there. Uh, my counter has a typo somewhere. Yeah, I uh, just m counter. So, effectively a loop when uh, you look how how the code looks the way uh, well how the code looks in in the machine representation it will it will kind of look this way. So as we seen it initializes, then it skips. Uh, like this, yeah. Then it skips, uh, goes directly to the condition. If the condition is no longer met, then it breaks out. Then otherwise it executes code and it jumps to next. And pretty much a uh, break statement here is e is equivalent to go to done. And um, continue is just equivalent to go to next. Um right and we are running out of time so let's uh use the last minutes uh we have to take maybe a look um how this switch here is implemented in the by the compiler oops uh, we have a small bug somewhere uh right 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 it does not like um to have a label and then no code to execute after the label, um, that is annoying. Can we do it like this? Yeah. Uh, so we can just kind of specify that there is no code, and then it will also um, be fine with that. Okay. But going back to our uh, code, so you see that the implementation is kind of very different than of our ifs. If we scroll a bit more up, then we see that wherever we have an if, we have the actual condition, then we have the code block, then we have our next condition. So the all the conditions are spread around around the uh, uh, um, not around across the whole code um, which we have here. When we, however, look on the implementation of the switch, it looks quite different. It has at the beginning um, a table where it um, where a table. Um, it has a code block where it checks all the conditions and then it has the code to which it should jump to defined here uh, below. So it first will check all the different conditions since I think we initialized it to 10. None of them is true. So uh, the last one, the last jump is done conditional jump to our uh, default offset. So let's step through it. it. All of the conditional jumps, none of them is met. And then we have our unconditional jump to the last entry. And here we see that if we would not add the breaks, like for here, then so normally we have like our code and then we have the break which just jumps to the end. And in this case, where we just have the code and we didn't add the break, so then it just continues with the next and the next and the next entry. So it kind of um, allows you to generate very efficient code if you can, if you just need to compare with different single values. So. Um, it is recommended uh, if you really just want to compare with states or something like that, that you don't use uh, ifs, but instead a switch wherever possible. As mentioned, the, the main downside of a switch is that it can only handle these simple types and you cannot make like a range case. So if you like have like three values, then you can just write, okay, um, for five, six, or something like that. But if you would want to cover a large range like here, then what you could do in principle would be a, a hybrid approach. Um, right, also, by the way, this is kind of equivalent to this since this 
condition here is pretty much the same as here if we remove that. So let's do that. Uh, and then this should be two. And then we should of course remove this because uh, oops, um, because this cannot be represented. So now they should do the very same thing. Not quite. Wait, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then here we have for the value number we're missing the value number three. So let's add this as well. Uh, one, 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 two, two, two. That would set it to three. And what we would basically need to do if we want uh, to fully implement what this loop could do is we would in the default case need to add an if which we can. So if this then uh, two and we actually can be a, a kind of funny about it. We, we don't need to make like else uh, that, but instead we can just exploit the pr uh, property of break and then just have our if and then break out of this then this break jumps to here and this line will not be executed if this if it's true so um, even if you cannot represent everything with a switch that you can do with an if um, if <laughs> whatever you are doing is um, mostly representable by a switch then you can just use a switch with an if in the default case to uh, implement something that fully represents your operation. Um, and since we are running out of time, I think this is a good uh, moment to uh, finish. I will add some more comments here to the code and upload both projects to Moodle, as well as the homework from uh, somewhere here. Wherever it was, here it was. Um, so the idea is with this optional assignments, just to have this said, um, that uh, you don't need to do them, but they give you bonus points. And if you don't, if you would, I and it is advisable to try to collect as many bonus points as you c uh, can, because they would compensate for if later on you cannot do any o some of the other assignments, then um, you can still get a perfect score if you have enough bonus points to compensate for the things which um, didn't work out. And that's that. Um, are there any questions? Um, how many exercises there will be in total? Um, I haven't counted. Usually about like one per lecture. Although there is a um, for the last month there will be like one final large assignment, so there will be no small assignments in the last month um, anymore. Um, reference books. Um, well, the reference documentation of um, C++ is a good reference. Um, zack, zack. So here it's uh, maybe a bit uh, a dry read because it is missing all the funny uh, stories about anything, but it shows you, for example, how a switch works. The website is kind of slow, but it pretty much explains exactly with examples how every uh, f part of C and C++ works. So this is a good resource, and it also uh, contains information on the standard template library, which is quite quite useful. Um, the next question is whether there is a deadline for the last assignment. Well, um, the lectures go until uh, the end of June, the very end of June. So the default deadline is that um, the assignment should be supplied by end of June. So I think I need to g have you given the grades by a week after that, so um, I would not want to uh, have to um, explain why you don't have grades just because you want to have some extra time. So ideally you should support supply everything by end of June. If you have a good excuse why you need a, a week more, then that is um, doable. But your goal uh, should be to to be done in the last uh, last week of June with your assignment. Any more questions? Okay, since there are no more questions and 
the time is up, then I will stop the recording.